talk about uh, common emitter amplifier, before we talk about common emitter amplifier, we would see uh, basically some details about an amp amplifier. Now, amplifier, when we talk about an amplifier, uh, generally we mean a voltage amplifier, but actually there are four types of amplifiers. Now, you can think of amplifier as a controlled source. So, you can you have you can you can you have uh, four types of amplifiers. So, amplifiers are controlled sources either voltage controlled voltage sources or controlled current sources. Now, a voltage amplifier is a voltage controlled voltage source. Uh, whereas, when you talk about a current amplifier, it is a current controlled current source, meaning in a current amplifier, the input as well as the output are both currents. When we come to the third type of amplifier, the trans conductance amplifier, it is a voltage controlled current source, meaning the input is a voltage, whereas the output is a current. Now, the last type of amplifier is called a trans resistance amplifier, which is also called a current controlled voltage source, meaning the input is a current and that current controls the voltage source, the output is a voltage. Now, most of the time we are talking about a voltage amplifier. Let us see the uh, equivalent circuit of an voltage amplifier. Now, essentially voltage amplifier can be shown by the figure which is shown here. At the input side, you have a resistance R i, which essentially models the input resistance of the amplifier and the voltage which is to be amplified V i develops across that particular resistance. Now, the output side you have a controlled voltage source whose amplitude is A V O times V I and uh, A V O uh, meaning the open circuit voltage. Now, being a voltage source, it is it's represented as a Thevenin equivalent by, by its Thevenin equivalent model. So, you have the open, volt, open circuit voltage and in series with a resistance R naught which is the output resistance of the amplifier. Now, since voltage amplifier is the most commonly used amplifier, let us look at what are some of the requirements. Now, we would connect an input to the voltage amplifier and what we want is the entire voltage should develop across R i, which means that this R i, the input resistance here must be as high as possible, ideally it should be infinite. Now, the voltage gain could be as we require. Now, coming to the output resistance, that resistance should be as small as possible, since it is a voltage source, the resistance should be as small as possible, because any load when you, when you connect a load across the output, any current which flows into the load would develop a voltage drop across R naught. So, ideally the output resistance should be 0 and again bandwidth as required. So, when we talk about a voltage amplifier, ideally we would like to have infinite input resistance and 0 output resistance. Let us look at one more amplifiers, amplifier, the current amplifier. Now, the equivalent circuit of the current amplifier is shown here where again you have an input resistance R i, we need we would like the entire current uh, from the input to flow through R i and the output being a current source, it is re represented by the Norton equivalent and we have an A i s i i, whereas A, where A i s is a short circuit current and R naught, which is the output resistance of the current source. Now, coming to the ideal characteristics of a current amplifier, uh, 
since we would like the entire current input current to flow through R i, ideally the input resistance should be low, ideally it should be 0. Coming to the output side, since we would like the entire current to flow through the load R naught ideally the output resistance R naught ideally should be infinite. There is a very common misconception that for every amplifier the input resistance should be infinite. This particular equivalent circuit of the current amplifier shows that that is not so. We need to look at the particular amplifier in question to decide what its input and output resistance should be. If the input is a voltage source, it is a voltage controlled, then we need to have infinite input resistance. If it is a, a current control, then you should have R i 0. Most of the time when we talk about an amplifier, we actually mean a voltage amplifier. This is because most of the time we require a voltage amplifier and the reason is most of the sensors give a voltage output and uh, we more often come across voltage signals than current signals. However, there are applications where you might come across currents as well. Let us take the example, let us take an example to illustrate the requirements of an amplifier and to set the context for today's lecture. Let us think about a public address system. Right now, I am speaking into a, a microphone which may be a condenser microphone in this case or it may be in some cases a dynamic type microphone. So, the signal uh, at the output of the microphone need to be amplified and uh, you would have a pre amplifier in the public address system and followed by a post amplifier and finally, you would have an output stage or a power amplifier and the signal then flows into a loudspeaker. So, this is a good example to consider the amplifiers and the typical requirements of amplifier. Now, when we look at an ideal voltage amplifier, we studied last week that an op amp almost, you can think of an op amp as an almost an ideal voltage amplifier. This is because of the reason that uh, when you use negative feedback in an op amp circuit and uh, especially if you think about the non inverting amplifier circuit, you would see that the input impedance is very high, which is the requirement for a voltage amplifier. And again because of the negative feedback, you would see that the output resistance is extremely small, again what is required of a voltage amplifier. However, when we think about op amp, very often we think of op amps as ideal blocks, but there are a few uh, disadvantages which op amps have, general, general purpose op amps have. Let us look at 741. Now, 741 and uh, other uh, general purpose op amps cannot be used for applications beyond about 10 kilohertz. This is because of the slew rate limitation, which happens because of the compensation, internal compensation provided in an op amp. So, therefore, uh, most of the time you cannot use a 741 for applications beyond 10 kilohertz. Then somebody might ask, then what is the use of an op amp? Interestingly, most of the sensor outputs, the frequencies do not exceed about 1 kilohertz. There are very few sensors which would give you signals beyond 1 kilohertz. So, therefore, when 741 or other op amps were made, the manufacturers had that in mind. So, they know that for the 95 percent of the applications, you could use a simple op amp and have an ideal case. There are op amps which can be used for high frequency applications also, however, they are very, very costly. Now, let us come to the case of uh, discrete amplifiers. Now, common emitter amplifier is an example of a discrete amplifier. Uh, 
Now, when you talk, when you think about a, a discrete amplifier as compared to an IC amplifier like 741, a discrete amplifier can be tailor made as per our need, especially as we said the frequency response of an op amp is very small, we could actually make a discrete amplifier to meet our requirement. And uh, most of the time discrete amplifiers would not be very complicated and they are easy to build and also analyze. However, since there are many components and they need to be assembled either soldered or made into a PCB or into a breadboard, the reliability of discrete amplifiers is very low. Another very important uh, thing to keep in mind is discrete amplifiers need to be biased and designed very carefully. Also, in a discrete amplifier, the gain and other amplifier parameters are device dependent. If you compare this with an op amp amplifier, you would see in an op amp, the gain is independent of the device parameters, whereas in a discrete amplifier, most of the time you would see that even when negative feedback are applied, only in an, an approximation we can take the gain to be independent. When we talk about BJT based discrete amplifier voltage amplifiers, we have three amplifiers. One is the common emitter amplifier, which is the most commonly used. We will see a bit later why. Then you have the common base amplifier and you also have the common collector amplifier. Now, in my last lecture last week, I had mentioned the meaning of the word common. When you say common emitter amplifier, what we mean is the input signal is applied between the base and the emitter and the output signal is taken between collector and emitter. Hence, emitter is a common terminal and, uh, you and most of the time it is at uh, ground potential and since and hence the word common emitter. In a common base amplifier, the base terminal would be uh, most of the time almost at ground potential and the input will be applied between emitter and base and the output will be taken between collector and base terminals. In a common collector amplifier, collector would be the common terminal and uh, collector would be at, at AC ground potential input would be applied between base and collector and the output would be taken between emitter and collector. Now, let us look at common emitter amplifier in some detail. Now, the first thing we need to consider when we talk about a common emitter amplifier is to have an idea about the output characteristics and to decide how you go about. Now, as I said in my uh, just right now, one of the most important things about a discrete amplifier is that you need to bias the device in this case a BJT and the proper uh, with the proper operating point. Now, what we have here is the IC VC characteristics which is also called the output characteristics. On x axis we have V C E and uh, on the y axis we have the collector current I C. Now, the output of a common emitter amplifier would be V C E voltage. Now, as we know from this characteristics we see that the extreme left side we know is the saturation region and when you talk about an amplifier we are talking about a linear application. Hence, we should not, the transistor should never get into the saturation region. So, we should choose an operating point somewhere in the middle. Also, we should ensure that the transistor never goes into the cutoff, which is the towards the x axis. So, you would choose somewhere in the middle. Another very important consideration when you talk about a discrete amplifier is what is called the signal swing. Now, what we essentially do assuming this particular point here as the Q point or the Q point or the operating point, 
Now, this particular point you, you have a certain base current and corresponding to that you have a collector current and you have a VCE voltage. Now, when we apply an input to the base, the voltage which we apply gets superimposed to the DC voltage and the base current increases and decreases in accordance with the input signal. As the base current increases and decreases, correspondingly the collector current decreases and increases. Now, corresponding to that, the voltage V c voltage would change and we later we see, we would have a resistance R c collector resistance and we need to ensure that we need to choose this resistance value at the operating point such that even for the maximum sig signal swing, we are far away from the saturation region and the cutoff region. If not, the output signal will be distorted. So, one of the first things we do in a discrete amplifier is to do a proper biasing. So, we need to choose as an appropriate operating point, thereby we are actually choosing a I c value and a V c value on this particular I c V c characteristics. Now, as I said, we need to ensure that we keep away from both saturation and cutoff regions. Now, when we talk about biasing circuits, there are a few other considerations as well. Now, we need to ensure, we need to make sure that the small V B variations which uh, occur because of temperature variations should not upset our operating point. So, we need to shape, we need to make sure that the circuit can take care of small V B variations. Another important consideration is in a discrete amplifier, since we are using uh, discrete components, the beta value of, of B j t of the same type would vary very much, sometimes as much as 50 percent. If you pick a B c 147 transistor and measure its beta and uh, you go to the market and buy 10 such transistors and if you measure the beta, you would be very surprised to see that there is large variation of beta, sometimes as much as 50 percent. Hence, we need to make sure that the circuit is able to tolerate large variations in the value of beta. What we have here are uh, two bad biasing circuits. Let us see why they are bad. This first, first, particular, first, first circuit, what it does is, it essentially establishes a DC V B voltage using a potential divider and uh, it assumes that once you do that, the operating point would be stable. Now, the emitter is grounded here. Now, what happens is by in case of any temperature variation, ambient temperature variation or junction temperature variations, we know that the V B has a negative temperature coefficient of 2 millivolt per degree centigrade rise. So, if for, if for some reason the temperature rises and then what happens is, we have a fixed value of V B at the potential divider, but the, the V B value because of the, the increase in temperature, the V B required for the same current which we had is now less or equivalently, since the V B value is uh, uh, because of the temperature uh, negative temperature coefficient, the current now increases. Now, once the current increases, we would have another increase in temperature, junction temperature, which would again make the V B to again decrease. And then we have what is a process called thermal runaway, which essentially would make the circuit essentially that is a name given for unstable biasing condition. So, we see that this circuit is not suitable, say bad biasing circuit. Now, the second circuit here what we have here, here the what is done is a resistance R b is connected 
between VCC and directly to the base here. Now, what is aimed here is to have a fixed value of I B by choosing an appropriate value of R B. Now, as we said, there is large variation of beta between different discrete transistors. So, if you do this, what will happen is what we designed may not be what we get. The collector current which we desired, we will not get. Hence, these two circuits are not suitable. Now, what is commonly used is the uh, biasing circuit, which is also used in RC coupled amplifier, where we have a single power supply, a voltage divider at the base, just like the previous case. And the difference here is now we have added a series emitter resistance here. Now, the emitter resistance here has a very important role. We said in the previous case, this emitter resistance was 0. Therefore, what happened was whenever there was a temperature variation, when the V B changed and when the current changed, that resulted in something like a positive feedback. In this case, what happens is if the same thing happens, that is why that is I mean what we mean if the temperature increases and if the V B value decreases and the current increases, what is going to happen is since we have a resonance here, the emitter potential now will rise. Now, with this rise in emitter potential, the V B would now reduce. What we assume is that the increase in current does not change the V B, the base voltage, which can be satisfied by choosing R 1 and R 2 appropriately. So, what happens is whenever there is a temperature variation and uh, the V B value decreases, that effect is countered by the emitter resistance here and a kind of a negative feedback is comes into picture and that opposes this. Because of this, the biasing point would be quite stable and also we need to make sure that for large beta variations also this particular circuit works. Now, this can be taken care of by choosing R 1 and R 2 quite small. Now, what we do is we need to ensure uh, one thing is to ensure that V B small V B variations are not upset. We need to make sure that the voltage here the V B B voltage which is the voltage at the potential divider should be much higher than what is the required D C V B value. And uh, we need to make sure that the R E value the resistance at the emitter should be greater than R B by beta plus 1. We will see how we ensure this. So, as a thumb rule what we generally do is to ensure stable biasing and also to ensure that the operating point stays somewhere in the middle of the characteristics. What we do is we choose the V B B which is the, 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 the voltage the base potential V C E and I C R C the drop I C R C. We take all these three to be roughly one third of the supply voltage and uh, to ensure that beta variations do not upset. We approximately we could take the current through R 1 and R 2, the current flowing through R 1 and R 2 to be approximately 10 percent of the current I E, the emitter current. Now, the reason for doing this, you can think of this in another way. Now, the base current is much, much smaller than the emitter current. Now, what we need to make sure is that the current flowing through R 1 plus R 2 should be much greater than the current flowing into the base. If we can do that, then beta variations will not upset. So, this is the circuit which is commonly used. Now, for tomorrow your lab for tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon's lab, you have the common emitter amplifier and the same rules you would be applying. So, what we discussed today can be implemented. Now, before we talk about the so, we now saw the biasing 
and we saw how to choose biasing. Now, before we talk about uh, the BJT amplifier, C common emitter amplifier model, one very important thing we need to keep it in mind is what is called the small signal approximation. You might remember last week in my lecture, I, we talked about the Ebert small model and there we used the term large signal model and we said using Ebert small model, we could get DC currents or large values of currents for any value of base emitter and base collector voltages. Now, in an amplifier, one of the most important thing we need to keep it in mind is that it is a small signal application, meaning a BJT as we see from the characteristics, as we know from the BJT characteristics is a nonlinear device. We need to operate, we need to ensure that our application, amplifier application is an, a linear application. So, we need to make sure that the variation in the V B value is much smaller compared to the V B, the D C V B. So, generally what we do in any circuit, we if you look at the instantaneous V B value, it would have two components. One would be the D C V B value, which we obtain by choosing an appropriate biasing circuit and an, an AC V B, which is our signal. Now, in the small signal approximation, what we mean is the signal which we apply V B should be much smaller than V T, which is the thermal voltage 25 approximately 25 millivolts. So, typically we are talking about the small V B to be in the order of about 10 millivolt. If we do not have signals as small as 10 millivolt, what would happen is there will be distortion. Most of the time, we may not be able to appreciate distortion when we see it on an oscilloscope, but if we use a signal analyzer, then we would see that there is distortion. For that matter, any amplifier has distortion. There is not a single amplifier which does not have. All that we can do is to reduce the distortion. So, if we keep the V B value as small as possible, say less than 10 millivolt, then we, 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 we can get reasonably good uh, amplification without much distortion. Now, before we look at the common emitter amplifier, let us look at an appropriate model. Now, the most commonly used model and uh, fairly accurate model for analyzing a BJT amplifier is what is called the hybrid pi model. Here, let us let us look at the uh, conceptual circuit and the model. What we have here is a common emitter amplifier and this is what is called a conceptual diagram. This particular diagram has no biasing, it is only the AC signals are shown. So, that is why you find a short circuit here. Now, for as far as AC is concerned, a battery is a short circuit. You can think of since the battery voltage does not change, you can for as far as AC is concerned, it is a short circuit. And uh, we have small V B as the input here and uh, that causes a small I B current flowing into the base and uh, that would cause a collector current. Now, in the hybrid pi model, the input circuit base to emitter, you we have a resistance R pi which is essentially small v b by i b, the small i b would give you r pi. Now, the other parameter here is g m and g m is i c by v t, i c is our d c current, biasing current and v t is thermal voltage. So, once we are able to finalize our biasing circuit, once we determine our i c, we can get g m. Now, g m and r pi are related through beta. So, once we know what is g m, we can find r pi also. So, once we have that, we can get the hybrid pi model. Now, this particular model, what is shown here, neglects early effect. Now, if you remember, uh, 
when we talked about early early effect last week we said early effect is basically uh, the it basically talking it is about variation in the collector current as a function of the vce the collector to emitter voltage now in a hybrid poi model early effect can be modeled by putting a resistance across the current source and uh, that resistance r not is uh, defined as early voltage divided by ic so we see that once we complete our biasing and once we are able to determine the the value of ic we can determine all the small signal parameters that is gm r pi and r not so we are once we do this we are at a position to analyze the amplifier circuit now before we analyze our common emitter amplifier we need to look at the amplifier parameters a bit more carefully we talked about input resistance we talked about voltage gain we talked about output resistance let's define them properly what we have here is a block schematic of an amplifier and uh, what we are shown here is the input signal represented by the thevenin equivalent an open circuit voltage v sig and a resistance thevenin resistance r sig and in and a current i i flows into the amplifier and at the input of the amplifier a voltage v i develops and from the output a current i not flows into the load r l and across r l we develop the output voltage v not now the definitions the parameter definitions for an amplifier are, are as follows input resistance with no load is defined as v i by i i that is for r l equal to infinity now input resistance r in is defined as v i by i i with r l in place we will we'll, we'll come to this in a minute now we you might remember when we modeled the voltage amplifier we had an open circuit voltage called avo now that open circuit voltage gain which is the voltage voltage gain is defined as v out by vi with rl infinity or without rl here and uh, voltage normal voltage gain is v out defined as v out by vi with rl in place now coming to output resistance it's a bit more tricky what is generally done is we would apply in a very simple in a simple circuit is very easy to determine the output resistance but in complicated circuits what we would do is we would connect a voltage source called vx and find and connect that to the output side and find the current flowing ix if that's the case output resistance r not will be vx by ix at vi is equal to 0 which means the input to the amplifier that side should be shorted similarly you have another definition of output resistance r out which is defined as vx by ix at not vi is equal to 0 but v sig is equal to 0 now in the previous case the assumption is that your r sig is is 0 equivalent to saying r sig is 0 but in a general case the the series resistance of the source may not be zero so we you, you would make r v6 zero which means you would have the effect of r6 now let's it may be confusing why you it might it is quite confusing to see why we have two sets of input resistances and two sets of output resistances now to understand that we need to talk about what are called unilateral amplifiers Now, when you talk about uh, an amplifier, uh, certain types of amplifiers are called unilateral amplifiers. Now, in these amplifiers, the input resistance does not depend on the load resistance. That is, there is no output to input internal feedback. So, in a unilateral amplifier, R in will be the same as R i. 
an R out would be the same as R naught. Many amplifiers are non unilateral. Now, let us look at common emitter amplifier. Now, as we said, one of the first things we need to do is to choose the values, the biasing circuit carefully. That is, we would choose R 1 and R 2 carefully, we would choose R e and R c, we would, we would uh, these resonances would be chosen such that we have I c R c approximately one third V c c and we have a V b voltage of V b b voltage of one third V c c and a, a V c of one third V c c. Now, what we are drawn here is the common emitter amplifier. Now, we have the signal source here V SIG and an R SIG here. So, in general it is always better to keep the, the feminine equivalent resonance of the voltage signal source. Now, this is connected to the common emitter amplifier through a capacitor. Now, why do we need this capacitor? Now, what will happen if I do not connect this capacitor? Now, we see that we have chosen R 1 and R 2, so as to establish a certain DC bias here. Now, if we do not connect this capacitor, what is going to happen is, we are going to have this resistance and this voltage source also coming into picture. This will completely upset our biasing and the transistor will not work. Now, most of the time this capacitor which we have here would be of the order of uh, tens of p f or a few few p f sorry a few micro a few microfarad. So, typically let us say 10 microfarad. Now, again how do we choose the polarity? Now, 10 microfarad uh, corresponds to a electrolytic capacitor which has polarity. Now, how do we decide the polarity of this capacitor? Now, in such cases what is important is we need to look at one of the sides of the capacitor where we are sure about a, a certain voltage. In this case, we see that this capacitor the base side has a certain positive voltage, whereas this side we are talking about an AC. So, it is almost 0 here. So, the capacitor would have a positive polarity towards the base side and negative polarity towards the, the signal source side. Similarly, we have a capacitor here at the output side and uh, that is connected to the load here R L here. Again, why do we need a capacitor here? Now, if you remember when we talked about biasing, we said we would choose the biasing point based on R 1, R 2, R C and R E, which means that if I do not have this capacitor, the moment I connect R L, once again this value of R L will disrupt my biasing. So, for the same reason I need to have this coupling capacitor C 2 here. Once again, how do I decide the polarity of C 2? Now, here again the same principle, we need to look at the side we are sure about, about the polarity. Now, we know that the collector side of the capacitor has a higher positive voltage, whereas the load side is connected to ground. So, we would choose a positive polarity on the collector side and a negative polarity of the electrolytic capacitor on the load side. Once again, typically the value of C 2 would be about 10 microfarad typically. Now, we can have two types of common emitter amplifier depending on whether we have a capacitor connected between emitter to ground or not. Now, in the first case, the most common case, we would have a capacitor C E connected between emitter and ground. Now, in today's lecture, we will not look at the details of the low frequency response. Now, 
what we see is that the when we do the analysis we would see that the value of C e would be much much higher compared to C 1 and C 2. Typically C e would be the order of about 100 microfarad or around 50 to 100 microfarad. Here again the polarity is quite straightforward towards the emitter you would have pol positive polarity for the electronic capacitor and the ground negative polarity. Now, before we start analysis one very very important thing to keep it in mind is that we are talking about mid band frequency analysis. Again what do we mean by mid band? We can draw the frequency response of a common emitter amplifier the one which I showed just now something like this. Now, we see that the amplifier characteristics we see is like a band pass filter. It has two cutoff frequencies and let us call the first one the lower cutoff frequency and the upper one as the upper cutoff frequency. Now, we have a region in the middle which is called the mid band. Now, the, the, the frequencies below F L, the lower cutoff frequency, you have a high pass response, whereas frequencies above F H, the upper cutoff frequency, we have a low pass response. Now, what is the reason for the high pass response? Now, we can see that this coupling capacitors and the C E. So, these three capacitors contribute towards the low frequency response of the amplifier. So, we depending on the kind of value of the low frequency cutoff we require, we can choose appropriate values for C 1, C 2 and C E. Similarly, when we talk about the upper cut off frequency, now that is, is a region which is due to the device capacitances. This we will see a little later. Now, when we talk about mid band, mid band frequency is the region where the frequency the frequency response is flat or the gain is constant. So, we assume that in this particular region the coupling capacitors as well as C E are short circuits, their impedance are, are negligible. So, they are short circuits and the device capacitances are open circuits. So, when you talk about an AC analysis we are talking about the mid band analysis. Now, again let us look at the equivalent circuit and try to get some expressions for the, the amplifier parameters. Now, R in we defined as V i by i i. Now, in this particular circuit here we see that the i i is the current flowing, V i is the voltage across R b. Therefore, the input resistance R in is nothing but R b parallel to R i b. Now, R i b as we see here is nothing but R pi which we would have determined and uh, we know that R b is generally quite high compared to R pi. R pi would be typically of the order of 1 kilo ohms also typically or sometimes even less depending on the value of the collector current and the beta. Now, so therefore, we see that the input resistance R in is approximately R pi, which means the input resistance of a common emitter amplifier is approximately 1 kilo ohms of, of kind of that order. Now, when we talk about V i that is the voltage at the input of the amplifier. Now, our signal source 
is V sig. Now, if you write an expression for V i in terms of the signal source V sig, we can write V i as V sig times R in by R in plus R sig. Now, we know that R in is equal to R b parallel R pi. So, substituting we will get this as V sig into R b parallel R pi divided by R b parallel R pi plus R sig. Now, we said that R b parallel R pi is approximately equal to R pi. Therefore, we can write V i as approximately V sig times R pi by R pi plus R sig. Now, we see here that when we use a common emitter amplifier, if we have R sig significant in comparison to R pi, then we are going to get a much smaller fraction of the input voltage developed here. So, in this case we see that V pi is same as V i here. Now, coming to the output side, we can see that the voltage V out here is nothing but the current here times R naught, I have not shown here R c. So, should have been an R c also here. So, R naught parallel R c parallel R l. So, and with a minus sign because the current is flowing towards the away from the output towards the ground. So, the output voltage is minus of g m v pi into R naught parallel R c parallel R l. Now, the voltage gain A v with load then would be v out by v pi or v out by v i which is nothing but minus of g m R naught parallel R c parallel R l. Now, if you assume R l is equal to infinity, you would get the open circuit voltage gain which would be minus of g m times R naught parallel R c. Most of the time R naught which is the output resistance which we put which models the early effect most of the time would be quite high. This is in especially for discrete amplifiers. This is because of the reason that uh, R V A the early voltage for most of the transistors could be of the order of about 200 volts. So, if you are talking about 1 milliamp and 200 volt then R naught is much 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 higher. So, most of the time you would find that the output voltage open circuit output voltage is nothing but minus of g m times R c. Now, coming to the output resistance we it would be nothing but R naught parallel R c or we can say as we said R out would be approximately equal to R c since R naught small R naught will be very high. Now, another very important parameter is what is called the overall voltage gain which measures from end to end that is from V naught to V sig. Now, that we can get as V i by V sig times into V naught by V i which would be nothing but V i by V sig times A V. Now, if we assume that the, the resistance of the signal source R sig is much smaller than R pi, then we see that the overall voltage gain is approximately equal to the voltage gain. Now, this is an extremely important parameter to be a important point to be kept in mind and we see here a major disadvantage of the common emitter amplifier. Now, most of the time when we do an experiment in the lab, the signal source would have a resistance R sig for the order of 50 ohms most of the time. Now, the R pi we, I said it will be the order of somewhere around 1 k to 2 k. So, therefore, we would see that whatever calculations we do, we will be able to see that we can get, we get the same value. But if we use a common emitter amplifier directly for let us say for a sensor application, we would see that we have get much smaller voltage gain and the reason is the large value of R c. This is something which is very important to be kept in mind. Now, I would uh, tomorrow the lab you have a BJT amplifier circuit and there is a, a detailed design procedure is given there. So, I request all of you to go through the example there and you could all the 
equations are also given in your lab handout. You could work it out and in the lab you can check carefully. And as I said, when you wire the circuit, a few things you need to keep it in mind, keep in mind carefully. One thing is to connect the transistor correctly, the collector uh, base and emitter terminals will be connect, correctly connected. And we know since we talked about the reverse active mode and the normal active mode, uh, if you interchange emitter and uh, collector, we know what will happen. You, would, you will get much smaller beta and therefore, the it is as good as the transistor having no gain. So, next time you do not get a proper gain, it is quite likely that you have interchanged the collector and the emitter terminals. So, keep that also in mind and uh, before you come to the lab, do some hand calculations using the equations given in your handout and also in this and then you could compare that with the values you get. Now, the previous example of the common emitter amplifier, we use the hybrid pi model to analyze it. There is another model called the T model. This particular model is useful in some situations. We will see which situations where this is convenient. Now, the hybrid pi model is useful whenever your emitter is at ground potential. Like in the common emitter amplifier with a C E connected there, we know that the emitter is at ground potential. In such a case, the hybrid pi model is very simple. But in case if you have a situation where your emitter has a resistance to ground, then the hybrid pi model would be quite complex. In such a situation, this model T model would give you very, very simple solutions. Now, what this T model has is, it has essentially a, a voltage control current source model, something similar to what we used in the large signal model in the last week's lecture. So, you have an IB here, you have a VB voltage developed across a small RE and you have a control current source which is GMVB. This value was same as the value we had in the hybrid pi model. You also have a, this was a voltage control current source model, whereas here it is a current control. Now, in this case the only difference is the controlled source has alpha times I E. So, the controlling parameter is I E here and you have a small R E. And uh, in this model, you need only G M and small r e and G M we know is I C by V T and uh, small r e is defined as V T by I E the emitter current. So, once again this would be nothing but alpha by G M. So, once we know the biasing, uh, the operating value and the biasing conditions, we can determine these values also. Now, let us analyze now the common emitter amplifier with an unbypassed series emitter resistance. You have this in tomorrow's lab also and once again we could analyze this. So, the only difference between this particular circuit and the circuit which we saw just uh, before this is that here the emitter is unbypassed, which means there is no capacitor from emitter to ground. Otherwise, you have the coupling capacitors C 1 and C 2, which we said are must, otherwise the biasing will get upset. Now, what we have done here is we have used the T model here and uh, we can see here and in this case, it gives you an extremely simple uh, equivalent circuit and uh, in fact, uh, this will be much, much simpler. You could use hybrid pi model also, but you would find that the expressions would be much more complicated. Now, in this case, we have connected the V sig here, you have R sig here, you have R B here and uh, then at between these three points here, you have connected the transistor. You have between emitter and ground, you have R E, which is the resistance there and uh, you have small R E, which is a small signal parameter and you have a R C there coming from between collector to ground and R L. Now, once again we can determine what is R in here, which is nothing but V i by i i. Again R in is R b parallel R i b. Now, compared to the previous case, when we had a capacitor between emitter and ground, here you would see that R b 
R i b or the resistance looking into the base is quite different. In this case, R i b is V i by i b and i b we know is i e by beta plus 1 and i e we see since we have V i here, the same V i is appearing at this particular terminal also. Therefore, i e can be easily calculated as V i by small r e plus capital R e. Therefore, i b would be V i by beta plus 1 times B r e plus capital R e. Therefore, r i b would be beta plus 1 times small r e plus capital R e and r in therefore, would be r b parallel r i b which will be r b parallel beta plus 1 small r e plus capital R e. Now, most of the time we would choose r b such that it is much greater than r i b. So, we see that if we can do that, if we can choose r b to be very high, then we would see that just by increasing r e, we would see that the input resistance of the common emitter amplifier without a emitter bypass capacitor will be very high. If you remember in the previous case, our main minus point was that the input resistance was very small. So, in this case, we would see that there will be a substantial increase in the input resistance. However, there is one thing we need to keep it in mind. There is a limit to be uh, up to which you can increase R b. We know that if you increase R b too, mu too much, then we would have the problem of the biasing circuit becoming unstable due to beta variations. So, we see a, a typical design situation here. In any engineering design, we have trade offs. So, we see a simple common emitter amplifier circuit design also giving you this kind of uh, interesting features. So, the input resistance of a common emitter amplifier without a emitter bypass capacitor would be very high. Let us look at the voltage gain. Now, the voltage gain in this case would be V out, V naught will be minus of I c into R c parallel R l. Now, in our analysis here, we have uh, removed small r naught, which was modeling the uh, early effect for simplicity. And we said the last time also that r naught is for a solely for a discrete amplifier, r naught small r naught we said is very high. So, we could. So, if you do that, then we will see that V out is equal to minus of r c, r c parallel r e. And if you substitute for r i c, i c would be nothing but alpha times i e. And we know that i e is equal to V i by r e plus capital R e. Therefore, A v the voltage gain with load we can write as uh, V out by V i equal to minus of alpha r c parallel r l divided by small r e plus capital R e. This will be approximately if you assume alpha to be 1, then this will be approximately minus of r c parallel r l by r e plus r e. Now, most of the time small r e would be a very small number typically say about 25 ohms or 50 ohm in comparison to capital R e. So, we would see that the voltage gain of a common emitter amplifier without an emitter bypass capacitor, we see that would be R c parallel R e divided by approximately R c parallel R, R c parallel R l divided by R e, which would be quite small. Again, you could try the lab handout given to you and you could work out these numbers. So, we see that uh, what we, in this particular case, what we have is actually a negative feedback. And uh, when we talk about uh, negative feedback in one of the later lectures, we will see whenever we apply negative feedback, the price we pay is the voltage gain. In fact, we trade off voltage gain for other useful parameters. So, in this case, by getting a much lower voltage gain, we got in return a much higher input resistance. And also, we would see that you will also get much higher frequency response. And in this case, the output resistance R out will be R c, 
Now, another important thing to keep it in keep in mind, both for uh, the this particular amplifier we concern we considered now, and also the amplifier we considered the the, gen, the common emitter amplifier with a emitter bypass capacitor. He said in both the cases, they are unilateral amplifiers. And as we said, when we say unilateral amplifier, what we mean is that these are amplifiers where we assume that anything we do at the input does not upset the output. Meaning, if we change the input signal uh, source and that R sig value will not change the output resistance. Similarly, whatever we do at the output should not upset the input, which means if you change the R L load resistance, then that should not change the input. So, in a unilateral amplifier, R in will be same as R i. Now, in this particular model, we assumed we, we did not have the device capacitor. Therefore, our, our approximation of a unilateral amplifier was correct. Now, let us compare these two amplifiers, the common emitter amplifier with an emitter bypass capacitor and the common emitter amplifier without an emitter uh, capacitor. Now, in one case, we saw that the amplifier with an emitter resistance, which is generally called the degeneration resistance, we, we saw that the input resistance increases, but we saw also that the voltage gain will get reduced, but the advantage of the voltage gain expression we saw there was that the voltage gain expression was much less dependent on beta value. And also, because of the negative feedback, the other parameters of the amplifier also improves. 